You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Welcome to My Strategy with author and personal growth coach John M. Hawkins. John will provide coaching and inspiration, motivation and advice on your personal development in order to help you with the best decision making possible. So now, please welcome the host of My Strategy, John M. Hawkins. Hello and welcome, everybody. I am your host, John M. Hawkins. This is My Strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Very happy to be here today. And even happier that you could join us. Uh, our episodes are always live and on Saturdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. In this episode, we're going to talk about how giving back might actually be able to help you grow your career and potentially help you become wealthy. I'm going to talk about the science of giving, examples of top donors, and discuss all the benefits of not only donating money, but also your time and talent and how that can help you. We'd love to get your thoughts uh, or phone calls. Our studio lines are open at 866-451-1451. If you'd prefer, you can also send an email to talk at johnmhawkins.com. That's talk at johnmhawkins.com. And if you email us with a suggestion, we are giving away uh, several copies of my latest book. It's called Coach to Greatness. Uh, it was released uh, this year. Uh, we, uh, in addition to the book, you're also going to get a Starbucks gift card. Uh, this book is getting terrific reviews. It's gotten 4.7 out of 5 reviews on Amazon and many other uh, positive reviews, uh, even higher than that uh, on other um, sites as well. So in this episode, what we're going to talk about really is um, you know, giving and, and what giving can do for your career. Um, this whole conversation started when I was having a conversation with a CFO friend of mine, and I was having this conversation. Uh, we're working on a on a charity together on a board, and he said to me that there was research that showed that those who donate actually make more money and have the ability to create wealth faster than those who do not donate. Now, to me, that just seemed a little bit counterintuitive. One would think that you develop the wealth, and once you have the wealth, then you have the opportunity to be able to um, you know, give more money away to charities and, and others. So that really was the conversation that started all of this. And I can tell you that after doing my research, I've come uh, to have a different level of appreciation of charitable donation and the ways in which it not only can help others but can also – uh, from a self-serving perspective, help ourselves. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the benefits of giving. You know, why do people give? Uh, there's this construct of a charitable impulse that people have. This is a trait that people have. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're also going to share some of the research and giving trends. So how this, you know, what's the forecast for philanthropy? And you might be shocked. It's really increased in terms of how much is being given, but also there's a big shift in who is giving money. So we're going to go through that. We're also going to talk about the science of giving. There's a lot of science and research that goes into the not only benefits of, of giving to those who are on the recipient end of it, but for the giver themselves. There are health benefits out there uh, with respect to sleeping better at night, uh, living longer, happier, healthier lives. Of course, I have to caveat all that uh, and, you know, go look. We'll look at the research and we'll have to make a decision how much of that really is is helping. But that's also some of the benefits that we're going to go through. Then we're going to go through and help develop our own 
philanthropy skills, where we're going to talk through how you can go about putting together a strategy to help you create your own um, strategy uh, to build, um, to, to, to do charitable work and also to gain wealth. So from that perspective, I want to start with uh, an interesting article here that I found that, that tells us about the three couples who donated $1 billion or more to their foundations. Now, this is an article from 2017, so it's uh, dated by about a year or so. But basically, it says here that the 10 largest donations given this year totaled $10.2 billion, more than double the $4.3 billion total from the top 10 gifts given in 2016. Where did all this money go? Well, five of the top gifts went to universities, Four went to foundations, and one went to a, a conservation group. So leading the pack uh, with respect to top donations, we're going to go through the list here and talk about those top three. The first couple is Bill and Melinda Gates. Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, Bill is the Microsoft co-founder. He and his wife gave Microsoft stock worth $4.6 billion to their foundation. The second giver was um, donated uh, $1.9 billion, and the donor was uh, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife, Priscilla Chan. And the money went into their foundation uh, that focuses on education, housing, science, and the improved criminal justice system. The final billion-dollar gift came from Dell Technologies founder Michael Dell. Uh, he and his wife Susan gave a billion dollars to the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Now, a billion dollars, I mean, that is a lot of money to give out to a charity in one year. There's also a number who gave very large, a lot, number of others who gave very large donation donations. I have Henry Hillman at 800 million, Florence Irving, 600 million, Helen Diller, 500 million, Roy Vagelos at 250 million, uh, and the list goes on. So there's all these people who are out there donating lots and lots of money to these charities. So I started thinking, well, how do we go about, you know, looking at this uh, from a strategic perspective? And what does all this mean? So so I found an article here that goes through and does an analysis. Um, it's the American Enterprise Institute. Arthur C. Brooks tried to analyze the connection between giving and wealth. And it says here, to successfully prove that giving doesn't just increase wealth, doesn't just increase because wealth increased, but the actual increases in giving increases wealth. And this was uh, based on uh, analysis from the Societal Capital Community Benchmark Survey, which is a survey of about 30,000 people in over 40 communications in the United States. Uh, they took a number of things into uh, account, such as education, age, race, and religion. And basically, this societal, social capital uh, community benchmark survey revealed that people who give charitable, uh, charitably make a lot more money than those who don't, which makes sense. The SC SCCBS also revealed that, increases, that giving increases by 7% when a people's wealth increased by 10%. The fact that people give more when they earn more isn't difficult to, to comprehend, but what they wanted to establish was that it also leads to more wealth. So they're showing a correlation between those who are giving more money and the um, amount of money that they were able to generate from their own wealth. It says here that there's um, the analysis that they did revealed that volunteers have what's called a charitable impulse that made them not only just volunteer their time, but also translated them to giving more money. And this was interesting because what the study was trying to do was trying to correlate how not only did the that charitable um, nature give them the ability to donate more time, but it was money, also their talents as well. So it all ties into the fact that these people who, ha who are going out there giving lots of money are also finding ways to grow their wealth by doing more and more charitable work. You're listening to My Strategy. I am your host, John M. Hawkins. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the research 
uh, some giving trends and ultimately how this forecast will play out. Stay tuned. Animal lover, author, artist, and public speaker, Patricia Daly Leip is a Renaissance woman in her own right. A lover of animals from a young age, Patricia lives on a farm in Virginia and has rescued neglected thoroughbred horses, keeping them or finding them safe havens. She is also a published author, and her books document real-life experiences that she shares in her passionate stories, taking the reader around the world in a colorful kaleidoscope of life. An accomplished artist, Patricia Daly Life's oil paintings feature animals, portraits, stills, nature, and abstract, and she allows the brush to paint the image in an organic, natural way. A public speaker, Patricia is motivated to continually wonder about life and advocates for all of us to do the same and document our own unique history. To learn more about Patricia Daly Life, visit www.literarylady.com and www.patricialife.com. Com or email her at pdlife at gmail.com. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. You're listening to my strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. So happy to be here with you today. Today, we're talking about how giving back and donating can actually help your career and maybe even make you wealthy. Uh, in this episode, we're talking about the science of giving, talking about top donors and, and other. Right before the break, we were talking about the benefits of giving and talked a little bit about some of the top donors and those who donate the most money in, in, the, in the United States. And um, in this segment, I want to talk a little bit about the research trends and uh, kind of talk with you, talk with you a little bit about the trends of giving and, and where it is all going, because we are seeing a shift in the industry. Uh, in the past, uh, legacy uh, companies were the ones, legacy foundations were the one who were the most dominant, but we're seeing a big shift as evident by those large donors, uh, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates and, and others that we discussed earlier. So that's happening as well. Also, what's interesting to note is that with new tax laws, what will the impact be to giving now that the standard deduction has increased for individuals? So that's something that I don't think we're going to be able to answer today. I did a little bit of research on that, but, um, you know, that's something that still remains to be seen. So let's talk a little bit about the giving statistics. Uh, the information I'm going to share with you today is uh, from... A, a, a company called Charity Navigator, and they basically go through and uh, do research every year on charitable trends. Uh, the trends that we're discussing today uh, are from 2017. So it says charitable giving continued its upward trend in 2017. An estimated $410 billion was given to charitable cause for a third year in a row, and total giving reached record levels. Uh, this increase in overall size of charitable contributions is further testament to the integral role charities play in our society. So very interesting here. And right now, I just want to caveat this with if you are thinking about donating your time, talent or treasure, I don't want you to feel that this is only about those mega wealthy who are out there able to give lots and lots of money. But it's also about donating talent and time as well. And those skills that you develop are what builds that foundation to help you be able to grow and to be able to grow not only your wealth or in your career, uh, but also to help you as a person. So I'm going to tie all this together. So I don't want you to think that I'm hung up here just on these, you know, the, the big trends out here. But there's a way we're going to tie this back into our own personal strategy. 
So it says here, how much do we give? Uh, total giving to charitable organizations was $410 billion, uh, which we already discussed, which is an increase of 5.2% um, in dollars um, from 2016. Giving has increased in current dollars every year since 1977, with the exception of three years where they saw declines. And most of these declines are pretty logical. They follow the uh, – looks like the, the cycle of the economy. So in 87, we had the big stock market crash. 2008, that was a few years after uh, the housing uh, bubble in 2009. The average year-to-year -year change in total giving between 1977 and 2017 was an increase of $8.4 in current dollars, making the current dollar – change in total giving between 2016 and 17 much larger than the 40-year average. So who is giving? Who is giving? Uh, as in previous years, the majority of that giving came from individuals. Specifically, individuals gave $286 billion, accounting for 70% of all giving and representing 3% increase over 2016. Giving by bequest increase, so giving by bequest increased by 2.3%. Foundations, uh, which includes uh, grants made by independent communities and others, also increased. So as you can see, there's a not only the lion's share here are the people, but also foundations as well. And we have corporations on the list as well. Uh, where, is all, where are all these donations going? And So they're going to educational charities. Uh, was up 6.2 percent. Uh, human services was something that is in up there at about 5.1 percent. Foundations also saw an increase uh, of 6 percent. Health charities experienced an increase as well. Public society benefit charities saw an increase. Uh, giving to international charities was something that decreased uh, over the past year based on this report. Arts, culture, and humanities saw an increase. And charities that focus on environment and animals saw an increase of 7.2% in donations. And then historically, religious groups have received the largest share of charitable donations, and this remains true in 2016. So that kind of gives you an idea of where all of this charity is going. But also, as we start to think about our strategy for volunteering and donating, we now have an idea of where we might consider investing our time, talent, and treasures, whether it's in education, human services, uh, animals, arts, and culture. There's a lot of different ways that we can invest our time and talent and charities so that we, too, can be um, good givers. I want to go through now and talk a little bit about what the forecast is for uh, – this is, was for 2018. But they say that here that charitable giving doesn't drop, not yet. And I guess to say first uh, – first I should say I'm getting this information from Philanthropy Forecast. The second thing they have here is that the giving gap widens further. Since most income gains in recent years have gone to the top 1 percent, it's not surprising that this flush group has given more even as donations by most Americans have fallen since 2000. We ha we're seeing a new era of mega givers emerge. Over 170 billionaires now have signed the gift pledge for this year. The existing mega givers are, conti are continuing to gain steam and doing more. It looks like we have a new entry into the giving this year. Jeff and Mackenzie Bezos of Amazon, who's and Jeff is the richest person in the world, has now uh, started to look into giving as well. Uh, it lists here um, Bill and Melinda Gates. Um, legacy foundations continue to decline in their relative size and importance. So we are still seeing that shift, which means that as the legacy foundations start to decline, that's opening up more opportunities for us as individuals to be able to focus on our own charitable charities or also – and also partake in other charitable organizations that are not those large legacy ones. Uh, living Donors and Legacy Foundation forges uh, closer ties. Uh, funders set up push for the equity. There are also trends here for racial justice funding. It looks like that uh, fund actually is cooling. Uh, except in the arts where diversity is continuing to grow. So in the arts, that's one area where there is still a big investment – uh, Me Too makes its mark on the fundraising world, so that's something that is um, starting to be focused on as well. 
The Climate Change Initiative is another one that's coming in. So last year it says they saw several big pledges for climate change, uh, and they expect more in 2018. So hopefully that gives you an idea of some of the, the trends of what's happening in 2018 uh, for you to, as, uh, to think about as we start to build our strategy. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to go through the actual science of giving and talk about how that can benefit us physically. We'll be right back. America is out of control. Today's capitalism and the approach to money is in fact the symptom of a more widespread pattern of excessive behavior. In his book, The Culture of Excess, How America Lost Self-Control and Why We Need to Redefine Success, clinical psychologist Dr. Jay Slosar portrays an America where excess fuels the drive to succeed. Dr. Slosar examines the cultural factors that lead to excess ranging from obesity to fraud to pervasive budget deficits. His book examines the powerful economic and social factors and their impact on our psychological well-being. Dr. Slosar explores the psychological impact of increasing narcissism, perfectionism, self-destruction, and our identity confusion. He offers recommendations for helping Generation Me become Generation We. Those who resist Slosar's message will want to avoid his discussion of regulation and his recent message that at this point, democracy must be more important than today's capitalism. Get his book now online or by visiting thecultureofexcess.com. Hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. Uh, you're listening to my strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. Very happy to be with you here today. Today, we're talking about how giving back might help you grow your career and help you become wealthy. Right before the break, we were talking about research trends and, you know, how the giving trends have changed uh, over the last few decades. In this segment, I want to talk a little bit about the science of giving. There's actually a science behind this, and the science indicates that uh, actually giving can help you physically um, feel better and e perhaps even live longer. Um, the information that I'm going to share with you is from an article written by Alice G. Walton. She is a contributor and wrote this article called The Science of Giving Back, How Having a Purpose is Good for Body and Brain. It says, uh, most philosophies and religions, not to mention common sense, include a strong belief in giving back to the world. Not only does it have the obvious benefits of helping others, but it's apparently one of the most therapeutic things we can do for ourselves. One of the most therapeutic things we can do for ourselves. A new study, I'm reading from the report here, it says a new study from Northwestern, for example, finds that people who have a purpose in life have an un witting benefit. The benefit is that they sleep better at night. But lots of previous research has confirmed that they have a purpose, that having a purpose outside of yourself is not only good for your mental health, but it's also good for your physical health, longevity, and even your genes. She gives us a little bit from the study that came out. Um, basically, the, the study had a team of researchers who asked older people to fill out questionnaires that got at their level of purpose and meaning in life. For instance, they rated um, sentiments like, I feel good when I think of what I've done in the past and I hope to do in the future. They were also asked about their sleep quality, sleep-related health problems. And what they found from this study was that um, there were 63% less likely 63% of the participants were less likely to report sleep apnea. 52% were less likely to have restless leg syndrome and, and, and had moderately better sleep quality overall. So these are the people who rated their sentiments as, I feel good when I think of what I've done in the past or something I hope to do in the future. And they're trying to correlate that uh, attitude with their health says here that helping people cultivate a purpose in life could be an effective drug-free strategy to improve sleep quality, particularly for a population that is facing more insomnia. And senior author Jason Ong, in a, in a news release, uh, recently said, purpose is 
in life is something that can be cultivated and enhanced through mindful therapies. So I guess he's got a way of doing that. A lot of this to me makes sense. You know, if you have a purpose, if you're excited about something, if you're ready to get up in the morning and go out and do, then you have natural energy. You don't have to focus on, you know, the three cups of coffee and, you know, all these other things to get you out the door. And I think part of what this article um, talks about with respect to how giving back and having that that purpose in life not only can change us from a, you know, you know, from what we do on a daily basis, but it can actually improve our mood, which in, ter- in turn helps our bodies as well. It says here that a small part of helping no it says here that or it can be cultivated by simply thinking about what's important to you what problems you'd like to be a part of helping to solve or what volunteer opportunities are available to you so here we go into it goes beyond just providing monies to organizations it's what problem world's problem do you want to be involved with solving and how can you go about you know then providing your support to that particular um, that mission. So figuring all that out is what, when they went through and talked to these folks in the old folks home who had lived a long time, that's what they were able to trying to correlate this back to. It says here, a study last year found that having purpose in life was linked to some measurable cognitive benefits in people who were in their thirties up through their eighties. So now we're getting into beyond just how you feel, but cognitive benefits, participants rated, uh, how much they agreed with statements like, I live one I live life one day at a time and I don't really think about the future. They also had some people wander aimlessly through life, but I am not one of them. Uh, they also took tests of memory, execution function and cognitive function. Those with the greater sense of purpose, no matter what the age level, scored better on those measures than people with less purpose. So again, they're starting to correlate with those statements of I, you know, you don't want to live life one day at a time. You want to think about the future. Those all those attitudes, those values, all help you from a um, personal perspective. They also have some information here on a study they did a year before, where the same group had found that having a purpose in life served much younger people as well. So the prior study was 30 to 80. They also did the study on younger people. And this team measured teen sense of purpose in life by having them rate how much they agree or disagree with phrases like my plans for the future match with my true interests and values. When the team correlated this measure different outcomes, they found that purpose in life predicted greater positive self-image, less delinquency, better transitioning into adulthood. And interestingly enough, it was this was all unrelated to the five big personality traits, which is openness, conscientiousness, uh, extroversion, agreeableness, and um, neuroticism. And I don't even know how to say that. So, uh, but it, it basically helped with all those big five personality traits. I think that what I'm seeing here is that, you know, as we look at somebody who lives with a purpose, we see these health benefits. Those founders who, you know, founded large companies who grew their wealth, they too had a sense of purpose. They had a sense of or a mission of what they needed to accomplish. So the similar mission values sense of purpose that happens with a nonprofit organization also manifests itself in a for-profit organization that these business leaders are growing and starting to um, foster. So it's just interesting here, the connection between, you know, the science of how when we have a purpose, it can actually help us physically. But if we try and take and correlate that purpose with um, how these people who are very philanthropic, there's a very tight correlation. So now I'm starting to see why there's this close connection between those who volunteer and those who um, have wealth, because both of those require similar mindset, similar strategy, which we can apply to our own lives. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. 
We're on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about how we can develop our own philanthropy skills. Stay tuned. Attorney Renee Marie Smith is changing the way we sell real estate. She wrote a series of books called My Short Sale Guru Guides for all real estate practitioners. Whether you're a homeowner wanting to understand the process, an agent who has been handling short sales for years, or an industry analyst wanting to know how short sales impact your business, Renee uses her vast real estate experience to take a comprehensive look at the recent market phenomenon while relaying it in an easy-to-understand format. Through her company, Smith Title Services, Renee has counseled Counseled thousands of short sale participants and processed in excess of a thousand short sales. Her knowledge is transformational for real estate professionals and laymen alike, and her live presentations provide people the opportunity to ask specific questions about their issues. Buy her books and schedule her to speak at your next event. Visit www.smithtitleservices.com or call 305 705 3428 or email her at Renee at smithtitleservices.com. Isn't it time to sell your property today? Learn the My Short Sale Guru Way. For over 50 years, Evelyn Stapula has been a loving advocate for people with disabilities throughout the state of Pennsylvania. President and founder of Big Heart Bridges, her organization actively campaigns for legislation and support of civil liberties that meet the needs of disabled individuals with housing, transportation, and employment. Ms. Stapula has joined forces with a variety of esteemed organizations that advocate for the disabled. She serves on the board of the United Cerebral Palsy of Pittsburgh and the Governor's Cabinet and Advisory Committee. Committee for People with Disabilities, and she is a consultant for the Pennsylvania Governor's Conference for Women. Her many efforts have led to the implementation of a transportation program for the disabled with the Access Paratransit System of Allegheny County. Evelyn Stapoulis drives daily to serve the interests of the disabled, to protect their freedoms, and enable them to live normal public lifestyles. To learn more, please call 412-491-2605 or email Evelyn at ers92645 at verizon.net. Hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. You're listening to my strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. So happy to be with you here today and glad you could join us. Uh, Today, we're talking about how giving back might help you grow your career and also make you wealthy. We're talking about the science of giving, examples of top donors, discussing the benefits of donating, uh, not only your your time, talent, uh, but also your treasure. Uh, We do have our studio lines open at 866-451-1451. That's 866-451-1451. I'm also looking for your emails. If you send me an email to talk at johnmhawkins.com, either you have an idea for the show or you want to give me your, your uh, an example of philanthropy that you're a part of, uh, please feel free to do so. That, that email address is talk at johnmhawkins.com. And I am still giving away copies of my latest book called Coach to Greatness, which was released this year. We're also going to throw in a Starbucks gift card. This book has got terrific reviews. Go out and review them before you send the email. You'll see that it's got 4.7 out of 5 stars on Amazon and uh, even higher ratings on on other sites as well. So right before the break, we were talking a little bit about the the science of giving and how giving can actually help you physically. So in in this uh, segment, I want to talk about the skills that we must develop uh, to help us uh, become better givers uh, as we try and put together the strategy you know, uh, for, to help us be more charitable, which will ultimately help our lives. So the uh, the article that I'm going to be referring to here is just a – it's not just a, but it is a guest uh, blogger post. Uh, it was published a few years ago, but it basically is called Nine Positive Effects of Donating Money to Charity. So as we go through our philanthropy skills, uh, I'm going to try and correlate with uh, this author's interpretation of what is positive to what we can work on, and hopefully this will help us all with our own personal strategies. So the first one that's listed here is experience more pleasure. Um, In a research conducted by National Institute of Health, participants who chose to donate a portion of $100 they were provided enjoyed activated pleasure centers in the brain. Although this experiment was controlled and scientific, It did not show that donating more money simply made you feel better. And we we learned a little bit about that with the science of giving. So experience more pleasure. So this is one strategy. 
by actually giving money to an organization that has a purpose, that we support that purpose, can help us, uh, you know, be, you know, activate these pleasure centers in the brain. So from a strategy perspective, the obvious is giving money, right? Uh, writing a check, a donation, a dollar here, five dollars there, it doesn't matter how much, just the act of doing that can help you. There's also some correlation with the act of giving the money and thinking about that money and your own budget. Because when you start to think about giving the money away, it helps you think about your overall budget in general. And in doing so, be, makes you more aware of the money and where it's going and can help you also from a financial perspective on a small scale. It's not going to make you wealthy, but it will help you on a small scale. Second one here is help others in need. I mean, this is an important one. You know, we don't live, we, uh, it says here we don't live in a perfect world and there's never going to be a perfect time to give, but there's always people out there who are in need of help. If you don't have money to give, I think something else you could always think about is how can you help others in need? And by, uh, you know, helping others in need, that can help activate some of those uh, good feelings and help you, um, you know, feel better about yourself. They have number three here as a tax deduction. I'm assuming most of you out there who have the means to donate cash, clothes, other things, you're already getting your tax deduction. We don't know what's going to happen with this year with the change in the tax laws, but ultimately, you know, giving something away to a charity, it could potentially help you financially. And so now you've got two pleasure sensors that are being uh, – activated there. You've got, you're giving money to a charity that you support, but also there's the benefit for you in the, um, in way of a, a tax benefit. It says here, also bring more meaning to your life. When you donate more money to charity, you create opportunities to meet new people who believe in the same causes. And I a hundred percent agree with this. When you are out there meeting with charities, whether it's a golfing tournament or you know, you're at a charitable banquet, a charitable dinner, you're volunteering at the food bank. As you go through and do that work, you are going to meet other like-minded individuals. And those like-minded individuals are going to help you to meet new people, potentially open up friendships, and you know, can help you uh, bring more meaning to your life. The next one here, number five, is promote generosity in your children. When your kids see you are donating money, they're more, much more likely – to adopt a giving mindset as they grow up. Now, this uh, author here, she says she's written from personal experience where she's donated money to a variety of charities over the years and always made to ensure her eight-year-old son of her efforts. And then she says here the last Christmas when she and her son were shopping at a mall, he spotted a kiosk for a charity, and rather than spending some of his allotted money on Christmas gifts, he gave it to sponsor the Hungry Children Overseas. So there you go. He's uh, promoting generosity in your children. Can also help to motivate friends and family. When you let your friends and family know of your charitable donations, they find themselves more motivated to undertake their own efforts. She says here, it takes a village to address issues such as world poverty, world poverty, scientific advancement, early childhood education, which all stokes passions in the folks around you. She also says it realized every little bit helps. And I think statistically, when we looked at the number of individuals who are growing, and I believe the number was $285 billion that was donated of the 410, those are not all large investments. Um, we, we, you know, what was there, $10 billion from the high level that we're donating money um, where they donated a billion or more. But most of that is coming from in smaller denominations. It also says here that you can improve your personal management. Where he says, if you scheduled a hundred dollars donation every month for a particular charity, it will motivate you more to attend to your own finances. So, as you can see, there's a number of things we can start to consider as we start to put together our own personal strategy um, with respect to how we can uh, start thinking about our own ways to donate or give our time, talent, or treasure. You're listening to My Strategy. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. We're coming to you live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. 
Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about ways you can create your own strategy, talk about the skills you need and help you find solutions. We'll be right back. Jenny Friend is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a certified clinical sexologist, commonly known as a sex therapist with over 30 years of experience in the field of sexuality. She's been a researcher and teacher and is further trained in human development over the lifespan. She's also a published author and a radio personality. Her specialized training in lifespan developments means she can help individuals, couples, and families through difficult developmental phases. Her primary ways of working are through the tools of cognitive, behavioral, and psychoenergetics theories and techniques. Couples, individual men and women, and families are also welcome. She can meet in her office in Costa Mesa, California, or on the Internet through Skype at Jenny Friend MFT. Call 714-210-9200. You can also send an email from her website at www.centerforclarity.org. That phone number again is 714-210-9200. Introducing BetterHomeAndGarden.com. That's www.BetterHomeAndGarden.com with just the letter N in Better Home and Garden. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the highest quality products on the market that are environmentally safe and effective and to make them available to you at the lowest possible prices. BetterHomeAndGarden.com understands that kind of creativity and do-it-yourself attitude. Thus, we developed our website, BetterHomeAndGarden.com. BetterHomeAndGarden.com offers you the following products right online. Bath, bedding, collectibles, craft, sewing and hobby, food and beverage, furniture, home decor, kitchen and dining, lamps and lighting, large appliances, musical instruments, outdoor cooking, patio items, pet supplies, plant and garden, rug and floor covering, small appliances, travel and luggage, and so much more. Better Home and Garden is an online retailer offering a wide variety of high-quality brand name merchandise at discount prices. Our service is personal and we aim to please. Visit us at www.betterhomeandgarden.com. Make your home your own. Hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. This is my strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Very happy to be here with you today. Today we're talking about how giving back might actually help you not only grow your career, but also become wealthy. We're talking about the science of giving, sharing examples of top donors, and discussing the benefits of donating not only your treasure, but your time and talent as well. Right before the break, we were talking about um, how you can go about developing your philanthropy skills. Uh, we talked a little bit about how you know it's not just about the money, but it's also about donating uh, your time, talent. Uh, just engaging and showing up uh, can help you uh, from a strategy perspective. So in this segment, I want to talk a little bit about how we go about creating a strategy uh, to put together our own um, our own um, plan for uh, doing charitable work. So, as as I mention every week, it really comes down to a you know a very systematic approach um, on how we do that. There's five different areas that we need to focus on. The first is awareness, and from an awareness perspective, we should really start to think about. You know, what is our vision? What are our goals? What do we want to achieve? Now, with respect to donations and your time, talent, and chair and uh, time, talent, and treasures, this goes to, for many of these people who are donating, their legacy. So from my perspective, those who are donating are trying to create a legacy that goes beyond just what they had accomplished in their professional lives. At the end of the day, you can't take any of the money with you, or, well, I guess we don't know that, but <laughs> you can't. And, um, but so basically what it comes down to then is how do we go about um, having a lasting legacy? How do we go about having our names live on when those corporations that these, you know, large benevolent um you know, owners are, are running, how does their name go on? So it's the vision. And from a vision perspective, our vision might not be as large and grandiose as a Bill Gates or Melinda Gates or somebody along those lines, but we all have our own sense of who we are and what we want people to think of us as, you know, not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but when we're gone. So this is something that has lasting implications. 
Um, so you really want to think about where are you in your personal life? Where are you in the stages of life? You know, and ultimately, what do you want to do? Are you looking to grow wealth? Are you looking to be a better person? Are you looking to extend your life because of all the, the benefits of giving? Are you looking for friends? There's a lot of things that you can gain. So now we need to become aware of those. So the second phase of that is assess and analyze. So we have now have a vision of what we want to do. And, you know, you can pick your vision. You know, maybe it's want to meet new friends because you're not finding the friends. So you pick the, the charitable organization. Now we want to assess and analyze and figure out what are those steps that we're doing today that are not getting us to that end goal? And what are the steps we could potentially be doing to help us get to that goal? So if you're in a habit of, you know, going and watching, I don't know, going watching a movie every Saturday and you're in a movie theater, it's quiet, you're not really talking to a lot of people, your social engagement is relatively low there. Well, what if you were to, you know, not do that activity and go volunteer at a food bank or go volunteer you know, another charity. So those are the things that we need to be thinking about is what are the activities that we're engaged in today that are taking us farther away from that vision and then try and figure out what are those activities that we could be putting in place. So the activities that we could be putting in place is the third element, which is strategize and plan. So we want to think about those courses of actions that we'd identify, and maybe the course of action was going and watching a movie every Saturday by, my, by yourself. And you would determine that, you know, this course of action is not helping me get to my goal. So what you want to do then is you want to figure out what are those other courses of actions that you could be engaged with that are ultimately going to help you get closer to your goal. So if from an awareness perspective, it was I wanted to have friends and I wanted to have a lasting legacy. But if your actions from the assess and analyze where I am now, you know, really focusing on going to the movies on Saturday, if you went to the movie on Saturday, you have a very little chance of ultimately reaching that goal. So you want to put in strategies and courses of actions that are going to help you get there. So that's where you could substitute their volunteering at the food bank or I am going down to the local pet shelter because that's a cause that I believe in. I believe in animals and I believe that, you know, we need to help them. So those are things you can start to think about from a strategic perspective and, you know, how all of that plays out. There's other ways that you could do it from a philanthropic perspective. You know, we talked about having a purpose in life. You know, in your awareness, start to think about what is your purpose in life and what are those things that you want to be working with? What makes you happy? What are your value systems? What do you believe in? And when you have a clear view of your values, what you believe in, that's going to give you the ability to start to really narrow down those areas that you can focus on. There were so many areas that we went through that, um, you know, from a volunteering perspective, everything from education to social justice to health care to, um, you know, pets and arts. There's so many things out there. So really start to think about those value systems and what you have a passion for and purpose for. If you have a passion and a purpose, it's going to be so easy for you to get out there and volunteer. The next thing we need to do is implement our plan. So while we're talking and planning and, you know, maybe I will go do this one day and I'll set it up for next next year. Don't wait. Don't wait. Start executing on the plan today. It's as simple as you know, try, maybe you just try them out, try out a few of these. If, you know, look at places to volunteer, there's soup kitchens. There's so many ways that you could just go out there, spend 15 minutes, walk into it, just see what it's about. You might get a sense of belonging and you want to help out. You could go there and, and find out that it's not someplace you want to be, but now, you know, and by, it's all about engagement. It's about getting out there, trying something and figuring it out what works, which means that we need to have a support system in place. We need to, and that support system are going to be those people who you meet as you start to engage and go out there and find these opportunities. You're listening to My Strategy. I am your host, John M. Hawkins, 
We're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. When we come back, we're going to talk about how we can put this plan in place. Stay tuned. The earliest human societies worshipped a female goddess. Little is known about this time because we did not always have a written recorded history. It was around 3100 B.C. when the Sumerians invented the first written language, and everything that preceded this time is prehistory. The prehistorical record includes all of women's unwritten history from 30,000 B.C. to the time that men began achieving political power around 3,000 B.C. Male feminist artist Kimberly Berg maintains a strong position in educating and inspiring both men and women through his devotional art to the goddess in all women. Studying their history is paramount to understanding who women were and who they would become later living in a patriarchal society. To learn more about this important time in our history, go to www.isisrising.net. There are artists and then there's Alice Asmar. This award-winning artist has spent her entire life devoted to her artistic pursuits and has had a lifelong fascination with American Indians of the southwestern United States. Her book, Dance to the Great Spirit, showcases her drawings and paintings inspired by sacred rituals of the Pueblo Indians, and four of her lithographs are in permanent collection at the National Museum of American History and the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. She is one of four artists in the United States to win a Woolley Fellowship for study in Paris at Le Col des Beaux-Arts and has been featured in numerous publications. She's exhibited at the world's most prestigious museums and galleries and recently won a 20-year service award from the Burbank City Council and the inaugural art competition of the Foundation of the United States in Paris. Visit www.asmarart.com, www.aliceasmarinternational.com and email alice at aliceasmar at aol.com. Hello and welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. We're coming to you live from the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Uh, This is my strategy. Very happy to be with you here today. Today we've been talking about how um, giving back might help you grow your career and make you wealthy. Uh, We talked about the science of giving, went through examples of top donors and also discuss the benefits of not only donating your treasure, but your time and talent as well. We're always looking for your feedback, so please uh, give us a call at 866-451-1451 or send us an email to talk at johnmhawkins.com. Well, today's episode uh, has all been all about um, charitable uh, giving, and the reason why I decided to go after this topic was based on a conversation I had with a friend of mine who talked about, he's a CFO friend, who talked about how that uh, people who give uh, generously not only um, were able, you know, actually increase their wealth. So in this segment, we in this show, we went through and we're trying to figure out What are the things that uh, would support his thesis that uh, giving can make you wealthier, um, but also um, find ways that we could apply some of those strategies to our own lives? So in this show, we've gone through, you know, the benefits of giving. Uh, We've talked about why people give. Uh, The charitable impulse is something that I think that is, is either innate in us or it's not. I firmly believe that anybody could have that. Uh, Gene turned on, um, but I think you have to engage, and I think you have to be aware of it uh, before it does get turned on. We also went through and talked about the research and looking at the giving trends and how, um, you know, the way um, monies are donated to these charities is changing. You know, less and less are we seeing these legacy foundations giving money, and we're seeing more individuals give money which shows that uh, people are starting to see the value of giving uh, their time, talent, and treasure, and it's starting to ultimately help them as well. We also talked a little bit about the science of giving and went through some um, studies that show how giving can actually give you a sense of purpose. And that uh, sense of purpose Uh, They tied all this into a a study that they did of people um, 
teenagers all the way up to 80 years of age where they looked at uh, their, 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 what they thought about and basically uh, tied that into um, how they could then um, basically take that, how, how they could take that and tie it into their actions and what they were doing. So those who were more involved and had a purpose – tended to live longer and lived healthier lives. We also talked a little bit about how you can go about developing your own philanthropy skills by just really engaging, showing up, and and being involved in part of it. And, and then we also talked about how you can put together your own strategy. I think, you know, my conclusion is that all of this comes down to if you're going to put this new plan in place, you really need to start to become aware of how to break your old habits. If you're in the habit of doing something today, you know, why are you in that habit? Really assess why you're in that habit and then find a way to consciously pr do the prioritization and put a new pattern in place so that you can start to focus on the new goal, the new intention, so that you can ultimately accomplish that goal. Also, when you have this plan in place and start to work through it, it's going to help give you clarity. And the more clarity you have, uh, the better chance you have of being able to solve any problem that comes up, which means that, you know, we need to be very specific with our goal setting. And if you have a goal out there, you know, what is, is a goal to you might not be a goal in someone else's mind. So you always want to make sure that those goals are very specific, measurable, actionable, relevant, and timely. In case you missed this broadcast, uh, you now can listen to us on iHeartRadio and also Apple iTunes. I'm your host, John M. Hawkins. This is my strategy. We're on the BBM Global Network and tune in radio. We'll see you next time. This has been My Strategy with your host, John M. Hawkins. Listen each week as John reminds us that just like elite athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of their coaches, he is here to help you achieve your highest goals possible. Here each week on My Strategy. You've been listening to the BBM Global Network. The ideas, views, and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas, views, and opinions of the BBM Global Network Company.